so the, the talk is uh, split up in three parts actually. So the first one, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about general machine translation, uh, what's going on in the field kind of a thing, and, um, and also an introduction to, to the stuff that is going to be interesting for later. And then the second part is going to be um, more or less about um, a short introduction to, to Keras and, and what it is just for the, for the people who are not that familiar with it. And then the last part is going to be uh, just a very simple neural machine translation model implementation in Keras uh, that shows how, how some of the stuff could be kicked off. But, but I'm gonna also going to give you a lot of information if you want to go further because uh, just, just a very little part of it really fits in this talk today. Uh, so yeah, but I, ho I hope it's going to be something for everyone. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be too boring for, for no one. Um, yeah, so I'd like to start with a short introduction about machine translation, uh, specifically neural machine translation, which is, um, let's say, very, very fancy uh, those days. So it's basically about uh, using a neural network for translating languages, one to each other. And uh, the, the big advantage here is that it works very well uh, with, with really large text corpora. And, uh, and it's kind of a new approach or, or some kind of a second uh, way of doing machine translation compared to the traditional statistic machine translation things. So, uh, so those, those two uh, categories, let's say, are a little bit um, competing against each other. And also, uh, what, we, what has been announced officially is that Google has switched from, uh, from the statistic model to neural machine translation as well. So they call it GNMT, and they say they uh, prefer it to, their, to the results that they had with statistical methods so far. So um, I have some, some, uh, some just uh, interesting facts uh, prepared for you here. So as I said, it's very por uh, promising in terms of performance for large corpora. So if we, if we, if we have a lot of training data that we want to use to translate stuff, then uh, it's probably a good idea to try the, neur uh, the neural approach as well. Then, uh, yeah, the common principle is just we encode the meaning of the input into a constant space. Uh, we use basically um, an, an encoder to, to model the deeper understanding and, uh, and learn the rules of translation. So, so it's, it's basically the, the most, uh, the closest thing to to an actual human being learning a language. Uh, so, but there, I there is a big problem that we have basically, which is overfitting. So the thing is that since we are not uh, using kind of a dictionary with frequencies that a statistical approach would do, we are rather just learning how to translate things out of the box. And uh, this also means that, that unfrequent words um, and observations so special cases, basically, uh, could be overlooked or are going uh, to be overlooked in most of the cases, which you will see later. But uh, this is kind of a big problem because uh, the, translation fu the translational function that we use here is a smooth one. So it smooths out um, unfrequent uh, word pairs and, and sees them just as noise. So this, this is kind of a big problem here. Um, and I will, I will just start off with showing you an example. So what we have here. Uh, one of the most interesting tasks in machine translation is translating Chinese, as uh, some people maybe know in the room. So we have here a source text which says, Ren Lei Gon Yo Er Sun Do Yu Ran Si. Sorry for my terrible pronunciation. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but what this basically means as a reference translation is that humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Yeah. So basically, a very simple sentence. But most of uh, neural machine translation models would translate it as there are 23 year history of human history. So what, ha what happens here is we completely lose the chromosomes because it's a, it's a very, very infrequent word pair. And this uh, basically turns out to, to make no sense in the, in the target sentence. So we have completely lost the meaning of the sentence by just, not, uh, by just moving out uh, an infrequent word pair in the chromosomes example. So this is called meaning drift in machine translation. And it's, it's yeah, the biggest problem of the state of the art 
uh, uh, neural machine translation systems. So let me show you some more examples. <laughs> You can find you can find some some really funny translations uh, all over the world basically. So so you you could happen to wait out, outside of rice floor noodles for hours uh, when on a Chinese Eastern flight. You could you could maybe take your child and and fall into the water carefully if you're <laughs> if you're not careful with your translations. This is also a funny one, not hurting the snake viewing civilization in zoos. But the worst of all, of course, is public toilet tourism. <laughs> I don't think anyone likes that. Okay, so, so those are supposed to be uh, errors due to, due to uh, neural machine translation, but it could also be just, <laughs> just very bad translation examples. So, yeah, and compared to that, um, I told you before, uh, there is the statistic <coughs> approach which basically work, uh, works like a fancy dictionary. So you, you have a list of words that translate just directly into each other. Uh, the only thing is you have a discrete model, so you use frequencies, and then you have kind of a probability uh, that you use to translate an, a Chinese word, for example, in an English one, or whatever languages you're working on. <coughs> so uh, the thing here is that there is, there is a lack of shared parameters, it means that, that uh, frequent pairs and infrequent pairs, they're both translated with, this, with the same function. And uh, so there is no way basically to, to get, uh, yeah, to overlook infrequent pairs uh, in general. So of course the, the uh, probability is still lower to translate infrequent words correctly, at least in, in all cases. But, but still you will always end up with at least some cases that would cr uh, translate correctly even for very, very infrequent words. Um, yeah, so as I said, SMT memorizes as a phrase table. So you could, you could just uh, imagine it as a dictionary. And the idea that you could, uh, that you could come to, ha ha having heard now about those two different models, is why not just combine them you know, and, and just use kind of a neural model with a complementary statistical support? So like, why not just be an experienced translator that from time to time looks into the dictionary to make sure that uh, infrequent words are translated correctly to you. So if I don't know what chromosomes are, why, why I just don't look it up and then try to translate it correctly to you. Um, so, yeah, and so just to give you um, an idea about what kind of the state of the art is, so what, we, what machine translation uses uh, currently a lot is uh, kind of an attention-based neural model, which means that we have a recurrent neural network model uh, with an encoder-decoder frame, so just basi uh, rather, rather basic in, uh, in neural networks in general. But, uh, but this gives, gives us the, uh, the opportunity to, to still find kind of similar words, although we are, <coughs> we are learning the stuff in a neural net. So for example, we can use a, a multi-layer -layer perception similarity function. So this is here the similarity function. We use the, the current state of the encoder. We use a hidden layer for the decoder. And then we get kind of a, a, yeah, kind of a attention factor out of it that we just, just uh, divide over the whole attention factors. And then we can, we can use it uh, in combination with the hidden layer to get the semantic content. So we get uh, kind of the, the, sem uh, the, the semantics of all words that, that uh, surround our word and update it with a recurrent function, like here. Uh, and we get the next word by <coughs> using a softmax function with a word vector and a word parameter matrix. And then we just use a very simple uh, neural network with one, with one hidden layer to max out and uh, get kind of an intermediate variable <coughs> that we use to learn the stuff and to improve actually the, the current target uh, word that we are using. So this is, this is going through steps. So if, if you look at the attention factor here, I is the step. So we, we go through several steps until we get to a, to a best match for the word. And J is the current word <coughs> that we're looking at. Okay, so, uh, and the most interesting thing actually in, in this matter is the uh, out-of-vocabulary treatment. 
So th this is actually the question, what happens if I, if I encounter a word that's not in my dictionary or that, that hasn't been treated yet? And, and here we can actually see what the advantages are. So we have manually defined dictionary that specifies how to, how to deal with out of vocabulary words. Uh, we can use it to construct kind of a local memory at the time. So this would be the extension to uh, standard neural network models. And uh, if you encounter a vector that is a similar word, we just borrow it and, and deal like this is the translation at the moment. But we have a lot of alternative choices. Where, uh, to prevent the collision, and then, uh, although we have no probabilities, we can rewrite a similar word by the out-of-vocabulary word in redirect the prediction. So we just take over the new word into our memory model, and then uh, can use it to refer back to it uh, afterwards. Okay, so just to compare stuff a little bit, uh, this is again our uh, source uh, text. This is the the reference translation, and then we can, we can uh, see the different results here. So Moses is the currently most used uh, statistical model, and we can see here it's actually not too bad. So it has a total of 23 human chromosomes, so it, at least it doesn't lose the context. So we still know what the sentence is about, more or less. Uh, the, neural, the neural model, um, as I said, is pretty bad in this case because of, of the infrequent word. But when we combine kind of both with this uh, new suggested model, <coughs> then we have uh, yeah, actually, actually a not too bad translation that, that still uh, is pretty accurate and also has the right translation for chromosomes in this case. <coughs> Okay, so yeah, so there is, there is not a uh, meaning drift anymore if we try to combine this. And I looked this up just a couple of weeks before just to test it out because Google <coughs> claims they use a neural model. Uh, and if, if you just look at the translation here, it's actually pretty good. So, so I wouldn't believe them if they say that they use only a neural model. They must have uh, some memory elements as well. Uh, that, that, they, that, that they use to not smooth out uh, very specific words as well. <coughs> okay, so uh, this was the first part, just to give you an overview about, about where we actually uh, currently are in machine translation, with a very different task, uh, being translating Chinese. And uh, now I would like just to, to have a brief introduction to, to Keras, just to show you uh, where to start if, if you want to do something like that on your own. Uh, so Keras basically is a deep, lear deep le uh, learning uh, framework for Python. I think the most popular one. And it allows for easy and fast prototyping. So this is basically the, the biggest advantage. It allows you really to, to get very fast to the, to the task that you actually want to do without having to set up too many things on the side. So we, uh, it supports also convolutional and recurrent networks, which is a really good thing even combinations of the two. And uh, for my personal reasons, this was a big advantage as well. So it runs even on CPUs. <coughs> I could try that in my notebook without having to use any uh, expensive GPUs for that. Yeah, then, uh, as I said, it's very user-friendly. The APIs are pretty easy to use. Also, you get quite good feedback uh, if you have some errors. So it's, it's very easy to deal with. Uh, then for everyone who wants to do some, some other stuff with deep learning, it supports neural layers, cost functions, optimizes, um, everything that's, that's really important here. And it's very easily extensible, as we will see later, uh, in, in a sense that you can, <coughs> you can use it uh, even for, for advanced research. So it's, even in machine translation, it's used quite frequently. And of course, it works with Python, which makes it very easy to combine with all the other libraries that we love in data science as well. So yeah, just a brief uh, introduction to it. Um, we have here, for example, a sequential model that is the, the most basic uh, thing to do in Keras. So we just define that, that we're going to sequentially add up layers uh, for our deep uh, learning network. And, um, and then we can just, uh, yeah, just use the add method to add up 
and new layers. So for example, here we have two dense layers with 164, 110 units. We have, uh, we have different activation functions like ReLU and Softmax and so on. And when we compile the model, <coughs> we, can, we can define what to use to, uh, to calculate the loss. So for example, categorical cross entropy in this case. We have, uh, uh, we have the optimizer that we can define here. We have uh, metrics that we can define here. So for example, accuracy and so on. Um, then, yeah, of course, we can, we can also, uh, in terms of optimizers, we can, we can implement our own. So this is basically not, not an own optimizer, but it's one of the uh, Keras predefined ones, standard gradient descent, mm -hmm. uh, stochastic gradient descent, sorry. Um, and you can define all the parameters that you want to use, and then just go on uh, with fitting the model. So for example, here, we have, uh, we have the training set, uh, the training set for X and Y. We can uh, define the epochs, the batch size, and so on. And then we can uh, yeah, either, either let the, the model fit uh, in the, with the uh, Keras function, or we can feed it the batches on our own with our own training function, if we prefer that. <coughs> so it is really very easy to implement. Um, yeah, then we just evaluate the model, get the metrics out of it, and generate the prediction uh, classes with the predict method and the test set and the given batch, si batch size as well. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so we, it's basically just a couple of lines of code to get, to get you started with any type of uh, neural network. Um, so this is also why it's very attractive to, to try out uh, some simple translation tasks in, in machine translation as well. And uh, so as a next step, uh, what I did was basically to, to implement a neural machine translation model from scratch. And we have a couple of steps that we, that we need to do here. So first of all, uh, we need to get a translation data set. Uh, in this case, I was just trying to, to find a very simple one. Um, and since, since uh, German is kind of a, my native language. I was uh, I used one from there just to be able to compare it myself as well. Then you have to prepare the text data in some way because most of the times the data set is not really suitable uh, to be used out of the box. Then uh, train the model and evaluate the model uh, to see how it turns out. So in this case, um, I went to Tatuiva.org. Uh, to, to get a tab delimited bilingual uh, sentence pairs data set. So for example, here we have this uh, German data set that I used with very, very simple word pairs. So as we can see here, there are simple uh, one word or two word phrases, I think even three or four times, uh, that, that can be used to, uh, yeah, uh, for the translation data set. And then I had to prepare the data sets to, to be used in, in Keras. So uh, yeah, basically the problem with, with uh, raw data uh, in general is that we need to get rid of punctuations. We need to, uh, to get rid of uppercase and lowercase content. We need to get rid of special characters. So in German, there are a lot of them, uh, of course. Then we need to handle somehow duplicate phrases in English and the translation uh, language. And uh, last but not least, the file is normally ordered by sentence length. So, so you, end up, uh, you end up in the, in the end of the file by having the, the most difficult tasks and uh, the longest runtime as well. So this, this needs to be mixed up as well to having the algorithm uh, working properly. So what, what I ended up here is just uh, very simple <coughs> word pairs uh, that, that show you the possible translation from word, one word to the other. I checked most of them, so it doesn't sound too bad. But, uh, but basically, the, the most important thing is uh, removing non-printable characters, punctuation on alphabetic tokens, and to normalize uh, Unicode and ASCII, lowercase. So yeah, just maybe some words to the data set as well. 
it was originally 150,000 phrases uh, and uh, phrase pairs, some of them very long. As I said, it, it got actually longer and longer the, the longer the file got. And uh, this is basically quite a good number of examples for, for training a very simple machine translation model. So we had, uh, we had just a problem that the complexity increased with the number of examples with the uh, length of phrases and size of vocabulary. So while this is a very good size of a data set in general, it's, it's very, very hard to, or it would take a long time to get it running on a, on a normal laptop. So if, if you want to try it just uh, to test the model, uh, I would advise you to, to shorten it to, let's say, 10,000 phrases, which would, would be quite feasible. So you can get this done in, in uh, five to 10 minutes of training on just, just a normal <coughs> laptop. And then uh, you would normally take about, let's say, 9,000 for training, 10,000 to test, uh, to, uh, to fit the model, and to see how it worked. OK, uh, let me maybe just show you uh, some code here. So uh, it's basically uh, very simple, as I promised. Um, we, have, we have just to load the data set as a first task. We have to prepare the English tokenizer by uh, certain functions that's, that help us in, in Keras as well. Then we are, uh, yeah, we, here, here we print out the vocabulary size, the max length of phrases for English and German. Then we prepare the data sets by encoding the sequences, encode the output, uh, and for first for training and then for test data. And then we define the model by uh, using the, the vocabulary sizes, the, the length of the phrases, and the batch size, 256 in this case. And then we just compile the model. So here, <coughs> this is kind of a custom, custom optimizer that we use. And we, we are also able to define uh, how to calculate the loss it's uh, again categorical cross entropy like before and then we just yeah so, th so this just prints out the model sum summary this is the basically the picture that is plotted here on the left I'll show it to you a little bit larger in a minute then we save the model uh, and set the checkpoint to uh, when, so when we go through the epochs that every time we uh, we increase or we decrease the value loss, uh, we save the new model and, uh, and always use the, the, best, the best fit here. So we're trying to minimize the value loss uh, during the epochs while we go over it. And then we just call the model fit function that does this for us <coughs> with uh, some re really standard uh, parameters. We define the callback to the checkpoint and then uh, we would be able to see the improvements in the console while we run the training. So um, going back to this picture, so this, this is um, the generated neural network. We can see here uh, there, is a, there is the standard em embedding layer uh, that we always use to start. There is the uh, long short-term memory layer, a repeat vector, a second long short-term memory layer and then a uh, time distributed dance function that in the end uh, kind of uh, prepares the output for us to be able to have a look at it. So, uh, so that's the training. And then for, uh, for evaluation, um, for evaluation basically we do more or less the same here loading the data set, preparing tokenizers. Uh, prepare the data, load the model from, from the last one that we saved in training, and then uh, we basically go through the data set and say, um, save a list of actual and predicted uh, word pairs. Uh, here I print out the first 10, and then uh, print out blur scores. So this is a bilingual, um, bilingual evaluation uh, under study um, metric that, uh, that shows us how how well the, the model fits <coughs> to the expected target word pairs. So if I go back here, you can see 
Um, even if you're not an, a German native, um, I can tell you that there is only one uh, yeah, sentence pair that has, hasn't been translated correctly and it said, uh, it translates a sentence into I couldn't walk instead of I can't go, which is basically not too bad. But all the rest has been uh, translated correctly in the first 10 pairs. And if you look, if you look at the blur scores, so as we, as we balance out the data set with the size of n for n grams, we, uh, we can see that the translation results are improving. So perfect translation would be one, uh, but we, we get results for up to 0 0.51, which is actually quite good, given the, <coughs> the size of the data set that we used in the end. Um, so, uh, yeah, so to conclude, um, it's, it's basically um, machine translation has two main different models that we can be used. So one of them is the neural model. The other one is uh, the statistical model, which are very, very different approaches. And it would be somehow good to be able to combine both, uh, yeah, which has been suggested in a paper. Uh, currently, and, uh, and Keras is the most popular deep learning framework in Python, can be very easily used as an API for machine translation. Uh, we have seen some uh, kind of implementation from scratch that can be realized with very little effort, and, uh, and this, is, this is actually very easy to realize, but the more complex the model gets, obviously, uh, the, more, the more amount of work we would have to put in. And uh, when thinking especially about memory augmented approaches, so the combination of the both uh, that I introduced, it, it would be quite a bit of work to, uh, to get everything running there. So yeah, I have added uh, quite a bit of, of uh, code examples here. So uh, I, have, I have the implementation of, of, the, of uh, neural machine translation in Keras that I showed you on GitHub. So you can have a look at it if you're interested. There is also an implement implementation of an attention-based neural uh, machine translation model. So that's kind of a state-of-the-art thing uh, that I talked about before as well. Then there is a, a neural machine translation Keras tutorial that's worth <coughs> looking at um, documentations of neural machine translation Keras libraries and a very, very nice list of neural machine translation implementations that you can also have a look at on uh, GitHub, if you like. Yeah, some other resources maybe would be great uh, to get some more followers on Twitter. Uh, that's also the play. <laughs> that's why people do the talks, basically. <laughs> but uh, no, that's also the place where, uh, where I will uh, publish the slides as well. If you'd like to see them, then uh, the GitHub account. Uh, this is a link to the, to the uh, memory augmented neural uh, machine translation model paper that I was talking about. This is a very interesting read for people who are, who are interested in it. And uh, documentation to the sequential model guide. And also the a ADEM optimizer uh, that, that has been used for the simple implementation here. 